The greatest leaders in business look for the emerging stories in their organization and use the data to choose their preferred outcome. What outcome do you want in your business? Listen to the stories of industry veterans, coaches, and consultants so you can choose your preferred business outcome. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of the Business Blind Spots Exposed podcast. I want to tell you a little bit, if you haven't joined us before, what the Business Blind Spots Exposed BBSE, because it's much shorter, what I, why I started this. I thought a long time ago that how much I knew was going to lead me to my greatness. Uh, and then I got older, got wiser, more mature. Uh, some wisdom started to sink into my head, and I realized it's not about how much I know, but who I knew and how much they knew. And my blind spots are all those things that I will just never be able to see, the stuff that you don't know that you don't know. And how do I, how do I sur uh, surmount that mountain? How do I get over that mountain? Is by others, right? Amplifying myself through others. So the Business Blind Spots podcast is all about finding those coaches, those veterans, the people who've got the cuts, bruises, and scars. They've been there and done that. And what they saw so that you don't have to go through the 25 years of experience that they went through to get there yourself. So hopefully this is an interesting journey for you. And I think we've got a really interesting topic today that I think is very much at the forefront of everything uh, that's happening in the world today. Uh, so I'd like to check in. Hey, Jerry, how are you doing today? Uh, doing great. Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh Absolutely. I'm uh, really excited. So Jerry and I actually, uh, I actually was on Jerry's podcast uh, a number of weeks ago. And we had a fantastic conversation. We did. And, uh, I think the uh, conversation will be take a slightly different perspective, but yet uh, I expect it all the same to be a really engaging conversation and topic. So yes, yes, indeed. So let me do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. And what I want to do is uh, first say anybody who's watching this, whether it's on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever else you might be seeing this, feel free to make comments uh, because I'll tell you that this is actually really an interesting topic uh, that we're going to be talking about today. And some points may not be 100% clear to you. And that's perfectly okay. I'll tell you most things, I am not smart enough to really understand everything to 100% the first time I hear. I uh, hear me it neither. Me neither. Me neither. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a long time for me to sink in for sure. Yeah. So ask, ask questions, put comments. Um, we encourage you to do so. It's, if you're probably thinking it, uh, there's probably a hundred other people who are thinking the same. Uh, ha hazard to understand better for yourself. But I want to give you uh, a couple of a snapshot of what's going to be happening in the next couple of weeks here. Okay. So uh, on 1230, uh, as in December 30th, I've got Tim Merrick. Tim Merrick is a really good friend. And we've got this great topic that we're going to be uh, talking about. And the title of the podcast is Empathy and Compassion. Why care? <laughs> Gosh, I can't think of a more relevant conversation for today in what's been happening with the disengagement, the great disengagement, the great resignation. Um, it's a really deeply foundational component for a lot of why what's happening in the world is happening today. That's on December 30th. On December 28th, I've got Kay Suthar, focus and intention as a business leader. I will tell you, as many companies as I've run, staying focused can be very, very difficult. Looking at the next shiny bubble is a very easy thing to get distracted with. But if you understand your intention, keeping that focus, actually, you, you know what your North Star is, what your own personal intention is, keeping that focus becomes a lot easier. I encourage you to tune into that podcast if you'd like to find out about how you can be more intentional, more driven, directed. Uh, I say instead of a 300-watt light bulb, a 300-watt laser. Because a 300 watt laser is the same amount of energy, but can burn through sheet steel. It's incredible. But that brings us today. Jerry Bolander, uh, he and I again have talked, but today's podcast topic is storytelling how it leads to success inside and outside your company. Now, I want to uh, give you a little bit of a background on Jerry as well, just so you get a sense of who he is and why I invited him to the. Uh, to, to the conversation. Give me a moment here. I'm going to tell you. I, I thought I had opened it up already. <laughs> oh, 
So let me tell you a little bit about some notes that I've made about Jerry and why I have him on. So he's focused in around PR industry, the PR industry, marketing and strategic communications. So it's all about messaging and the intentionality of the messaging, right? He's an engineer by training, which is what I love about him. He loves, breaks things down into components, kind of assembles them back together, but he's an entrepreneur by nature as well. 20 years, five years of bringing innovative solutions to markets such as Bluetooth, USB, RFID, semiconductor, DNA sequencing. Gosh, just a wide range of topics that I don't think were heard of 30 years ago, uh, but they're now mainstream conversations, uh, if not everyday conversations. Currently a partner at JSY PR and Marketing, a full service PR and marketing firm that helps tech startups tell better stories. Uh, wrote a recent book called The Entrepreneur Ethos, How to Build a More Ethical, Inclusive, and Resilient World. Um, and what I really like about Jerry, and I think you'll see this come out when we talk here, has dedicated himself to inspiring and educating the next generation of entrepreneurs on his podcast, The Entrepreneur Ethos Podcast. Um, Jerry, did I do a fair job of kind of wrapping a lot of you into just maybe yeah. 90 seconds? Wow, I'm impressed. Who is this guy? <laughs> I'll meet him. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we created this topic about storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, let's start there at the highest level. I feel like storytelling is such a relevant topic today. So many people could invest more time in storytelling. Is that the way you feel about it and why? Yeah, actually I do. And once again, thanks for having me on the show. I mean, our, our conversation on my podcast was just uh, inspirational and I just really got a lot out of it. So I was just thrilled that you'd allow me to come on and talk a little bit more about what I do and have that continuing conversation about the power of storytelling and why storytelling is so important. And I mean, nowadays it's like a big buzzword, right? Buzzword bingo, like storytelling, be a storyteller, blah, 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 you know? Um, and while that's true, and there's been a lot of focus on it and people are trying to re-come back to this, um, we've actually been telling stories to each other for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. I mean, you and I are talking on Zoom right now because our ancestors told the best stories. I mean, kind of crazy, right? <laughs> we, we found each other, but the reason is, is because our ancestors knew how to mate, knew where the food was, knew how to avoid the saber tooth tiger and figured out, oh, hey, here's a rock. Here's a, you know, here's a, here's a wheel. We're going to like go somewhere or whatever. Um, so storytelling's in our DNA. It's the way we learn. It's the way we make sense of the world. And so for business and entrepreneurship, it's only natural. In fact, I think required that if you're any kind of leader in an organization, that your power comes from your narrative and the story that you tell others. Because as a leader, do you really have any control over anything? No, you really have control of the narrative and you're trying to persuade people to your point of view, trying to persuade them to align to your story. Um, and that's a very powerful thing that we don't, as you mentioned, we don't spend a lot of time on. I mean, as leaders, especially in the tech world, I mean, you know, our net worth, our worth is in the last thing we did, right? Our prowess, our technical prowess, like, oh, I built this, built that or whatever. But that's like only half the battle. The other half of the battle is getting people to even care about what this thing is, this magic, as you said, shiny object in the world, yet another shiny object in the world. Who cares? I don't. Like, I got too many other shiny objects to do. I mean, you see some of these stories, like if you're in MarTech, there's like 6,000 MarTech companies. <laughs> Which one do I pick, right? Again, I, it's, it's interesting that, it, that it's a lot of buzz, buzzwordy. A lot of people put, like, they, they actually make lip service to it, and they think that tools and techniques and technology can help, which it can. But actually, fundamentally, you have to, like, feel it in your core. And as leaders and as entrepreneurs, it's our job to tell our story. Like who else is going to care? No one else cares except for us. Um, and if we can't have, if we don't have a clear, concise and compelling story, that's uh, our fault. No one else's. So I look forward to seeing that blossom more into the world. <laughs> well, I mean, and let's, let's talk about something that I think I like to believe a significant majority of people can probably identify with at some point in time in their life. And they've had the 
hopefully they've had the opportunity to see it. Campfire stories, right? Yes. Sitting around a campfire. I mean, it, it doesn't even have to be, you know, 20 people with, you know, nice rock sort of circle. That's marshmallows and the whole it, thing. It, it doesn't even have to be that sort of organized, right? Right. Just sit in the backyard, dad, with, in the backyard with your pops, your, your, your mm-hmm. mom, mm-hmm. aunt, uncle, grandmother, grandfather, whatever. It doesn't matter, right? Mm. Uh, those campfire stories are so memorable from so many different layers. Mm-hmm. And it's not something that's just enjoyable for kids. It's enjoyable for t- adults too, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I got to tell you, I've sat around a campfire, just, you know, just a fire pit with a bunch of friends, you know, sipping on a, you know, on a beer, just kind of talking about, you know, sipping on a cocktail or whatever, and just great stories come about. And the thing is, it endears people to you when you're telling stories, because not are they learning something about you. And I think this is the core piece here is that, you know, I've heard all these different ways that people learn. Mm-hmm. And I got to tell you, I think there's some truth to that. You know, people say I've got different, um, um, a kinesthetic, I'm a, uh, you know, an action rank, whatever the different types of, at the end of the day, I think what people latch onto with their mind is their emotions, right? Whatever mm-hmm. emotions come forth is really how, and, and, the, and the, the senses cement that experience. And that's, I think, why this campfire sort of idea works. If you can do in your organization, internal, external, kind of create this campfire sort of setting where everyone comes in there's this feeling there's emotion there's this experience but there's this fantastic story and you still remember it 20 years later is that, yeah. does that resonate with you at all oh yeah for sure i mean there's been there's so many of those types of stories throughout my career where i vividly remember where i was what was going on like in a corporate world or in a just in life because of the power of the emotion and the story that was told i mean it's it's one of those things where I think we're seeing a lot of that challenge in what's going on with COVID and we're all like remote, right? So it's a lot harder to tell a story when you're not in the same room, right? It's because you don't, there's a certain amount of tangible feel that you can, you feel the energy, which sounds really woo woo, but it's true. Like physical presence elicits emotion that emotion is going to make you remember the story. That's the same thing when you like first saw your wife, right? At the time, like your, your mate or whatever, all of a sudden it was this physical thing that, wow. And whatever she said, if you were enamored by her, was, oh, what the best story in the world. I have to meet this woman, right? I have, you know, hopefully she thought the same for you. And if she did, she married you, right? (laughs) So, and the converse is true with, with all sorts of things. And I think you see this even with kids, Uh, Part of the reason why there's such a huge mental uh, health crisis among kids is they're disconnected from that storytelling tradition, right? I mean, there's nothing like being, you know, I remember as a kid at the, you know, at the, at the playground playing with, with my friends. And some of those were painful memories. Some of those were beautiful memories, but the reason why I remember them is not because I was in front of a screen it was because I was there and we were telling each other stories and we were, had time and space to explore that. And I think that's how you find your place in the world. I mean, if you've ever had to convince someone to go out on a date with you, your kids to eat their veggies, a venture capitalist to put money in you, a customer to take a meeting, any one of those things, you told a story. And obviously you told a good story, <laughs> right? Because they did something you wanted them to do. So you persuaded them. And that's how we you know, learn, even around the campfire, which I think is such a great analogy because of the visceralness of it. You smell the smoke, it's cold, you're bundled up. You have a connection to the, to the world. You're grounded in this time and space. Whatever is being said uh, should be paid attention to, especially with elders and young kids and even younger kids. Like, it's amazing. You know, I always say, like what you pointed out, I want to educate and inspire the next generation of entrepreneur. Well, they also educate and inspire me, and which is fascinating. And the reason is, is because we're having a conversation and telling each other stories about our experiences, even though we do that via like electronic means, not as powerful, but still, that is, I think, um, why it matters, why we should do it more. And frankly, you know, I, I get worried that not a lot that in this, in the, uh, was it in the guise of efficiency, you know, 
we're going to still work remote or in the guise of this obviously horrible pandemic, we're not going to take a chance on doing something as humans we absolutely need. And that's to be together in community and tell each other stories and really allow us to feel that community. And I think that's what, that's what this, that's what binds us together is the storytelling of our community. So we made the topic storytelling sort of that, that impact or that value inside and outside of business. And, and I want to kind of tie a couple of dots here and you tell me, please kind of put a little bow on top of this when I'm done here. Uh, and the way I think of it is I'm always trying to think of this, what I call the through line, right? What mm-hmm. kind of just pervades throughout everything. And what I'm hearing here is whether it's inside or outside your business, right? I mean, those are really the two sides of anything for a leader uh, or any of the people in the company. People are captivated by good storytelling. So whether it's a customer, whether it's a partner, whether it's an employee, whether it's a colleague, they're captivated by good stories, right? You can capture their attention. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's going to fall off their seat, just, you know, waiting for that cliffhanger, but, but there, there are tools where there, right? there's an art there. Yeah. But yeah. What I'm hearing here is if you can start to speak in story, you have this ability to draw people into you. So it's not about selling anymore. It's about inviting them to be part of the story, inviting them to listen to the story. And there's magic there. Oh, totally. And totally. I mean, I think it, it all comes down to uh, how we process information. And and what's so, super interesting is that there's different types of information, right? So we've got data right? There's data. Data leads to, data is just facts and figures. Data leads to information, Mm -hmm. right? Information is a collection of data, right? Mm -hmm. Information then can lead to a uh, sort of knowledge, like, oh, this is how this thing works, or this is how I do it. And then knowledge, hopefully over time leads to wisdom. Wisdom's the ultimate, right? Like we we all want to be wise in some way. But we have to go through the process of this. So data and information in a vacuum in a silo without context, without a story behind what it means, never gets to knowledge. And how you've applied that knowledge and how you share your knowledge never gets to wisdom. And it all binds together with a narrative or a story, right? And inside and outside a company, you know, what you're trying to always do is make sense of the world. And making sense of all this data and information, and we're inundated with it. I mean, you can imagine all the just challenges and struggles. We're just like, we're in, I mean, the dings of our phones, social media. I mean, we can't keep up, right? I mean, even people tr- like listening to this, like they have to set aside time to listen to us talk about this. They have to consciously say, this is going to be important to me. I want to listen to this. And then as they're, if they look at on LinkedIn or wherever, there's going to be ding, 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 you know, like they're distracted, right? So you and I as storytellers, right? Because we're both storytellers, you, you with your company, me with my company, right? We have to captivate their attention. So how do we do that? Well, we take this data and information, we synthesize it into a narrative and a story to impart knowledge. And that knowledge, we hope, will lead to wisdom for not only us, the people talking, because we, of course, get a lot out of it. I mean, we're talking to each other because we enjoy the stories we tell each other and we want to learn something. As you mentioned, like your show is all about how I get rid of these blind spots. Well, I mean, this is great. Like let's, let's see how we can overlap our blind spots um, and remove them. And so, yeah, it's um, it, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult to kind of put your finger on because this is something that you can't really sort of see an ROI on. Like a lot of business people, oh, what's the ROI, you know, return on your PR marketing spend and all these sort of things. And even when you do have data and even when you do have it, this is a hard thing to synthesize. And the leaders that synthesize data, information into knowledge and then build knowledge into wisdom, those are the best storytellers. Those are the ones that are going to win in the marketplace because the best brands tell the best stories, but I think that's pretty much a universal truth. And if you can do that both in and outside of your organization, then your organization will be driven to tell those stories that are going to matter to them. And it may not be the bottom line. Sometimes it may be, you know, as for right now, worker health and wellness. Do we really need to go back as an example, the narrative and the story that companies are telling people right now. It's like, we got to go back to the office. 
Okay, well, we've been away from the office for almost 20 months. Like, it's this isn't going to be a hard, hard fork over. <laughs> it's going to be tough because why? Well, a lot of people, hey, I'm used to working from home. I've got elderly parents. I've got to take care of my kids. Hey, you know what? My quality of life is better because I can go do it. I can take a break. I can walk outside. I can do the laundry. I can change. I can cook dinner. You know, now I got to commute. Like, that's a horrible. I don't want to do that. That's a horrible story. Yet, when you talk to people, they're like, I miss my coworkers. I miss around the water cooler. I miss going to lunch. I miss the space. I miss not being in my similar room in my home office. Well, then how as a leader, do you, do you weave that narrative and tell that story about why it's important, not only for the company, but for your employees, both in and outside of, of the company? It's a very challenging thing because unless, it, unless you really truly feel that in your, in your, in your, in your, in your gut, you're going to have a tough time communicating that narrative. I mean, look, just look at the U.S. right now, right? All the challenges of, of like, there's Omicron, there's this, there's that, there's boost, there's that. And, and the, the story is super muddled. People are upset. It, it feels like no one's telling them the truth, right? It doesn't matter what side of the spectrum you're on, Republican, Democrat, cons- whatever. It just doesn't feel right. And why is that? The reason is no one's taking data and information, synthesizing it into a story to impart knowledge so that that knowledge can grow into wisdom. And fundamentally, it's because there's a gap. There's a trust gap. There's, and as a leader, you have to be authentic in that way, but then you also have to like, like tell it to me straight, doc, you know, kind of thing. It's just interesting. It's fascinating. I mean, this is, I'm so glad we brought this topic up because it's just critical now more than ever. So let's, uh, you know, you know, I always try to think about this. Um, well, there's a quote that I love and it's from Albert Einstein. It says, if you can't say it in one sentence, you don't understand it. Right. And that means a high level of actualization around a topic. And, you know, between the two of us, I would love, you know, maybe to challenge the two of us to try to get to a point where we can give somebody a sentence that they can take and start to say, all right, now I can put that up on my wall and understand how to tell stories, right? And what that story applies to, that's their choice, right? And I, I'll, I'll hazard something. For oh yeah, let's that. go for it. Let's do it. And I think, and I'm kind of spitballing a little bit here as I'm talking, right? You need to have the end in mind, right? If, if it's a customer that you want to take them on a journey to some place where they want, you want them to take some action, you have to give them the opportunity to see the end point that they want to reach. Hey, customer, I'm going to the top of this beautiful mountain here. And the vista on the top is gorgeous. It is something I've, I've rarely seen from the top of a mountain before. Do you like going to the top of mountains? And if they say yes, well, gosh, they're ready to start taking steps. Right? And they say, well, what, what's on the top of the mountain? Well, I, it's, about, you know, it's about 30, 300 feet up. Uh, but I can see the whole city from there. And I got to tell you, I've never had an appreciation for the city before. You're starting to tell a story there, right? Because you mm-hmm. have an end point in mind mm-hmm. and you're asking people to take a step through a doorway, some first step on, on their part. So really, in my mind, if I were to distill that to one sentence, and this is what I'm kind of trying with you here, um, a story starts with you inviting them to inviting them to a journey that is of interest to them. How does that start? How does that sound like? It's a very good start. Um, uh, One of the things I would add to that is that stories are about change. Mm -hmm. And change is a very fundamental thing to a good story. Mm -hmm. So if you're just beat bopping along on the status quo, and there's no angst in your life or pain or suffering, metaphoric suffering, hopefully not real suffering, but if, if you're beat bopping along and there's nothing that's in your way, you're not going to be forced to engage with the story. So um, stories are about change and about the movement from a kind of a you know, negative for a business, a negative emotion to a positive emotion. You're, if you want to engage with your customers, you need to have 
a clear, concise, and compelling narrative that takes them from the negative emotion they're feeling to the more positive emotion that they will feel when they use your product. So let's let's incorporate that, right? We're kind of uh, building on the fly here. I feel yeah, like yeah, we're yeah. Down, down it's super fun. Some, it's super fun. Duct tape and uh, duct tape and <laughs> build a car. It's Bail and wire, duct tape and a right. pair of pliers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm, I'm going to take this mountain analogy. I don't know anything about uh, n- nothing significant about hiking or mountain mountain wear or anything like that. Hiking boots, that kind of stuff. So I, I, I want to go to a customer. So now here's the thing, too, right? You need to know who you're speaking to, right? Exactly. Because not everybody wants to go to the top of the mountain, right? Nope. So if I know who I want to talk to, it makes it easier because my message is going to resonate with them. Somebody who hates mountains is not going to listen to my story ever. Correct. Right. So you need to know who you're talking to first. Mm-hmm. Now, if I say, all right, so have you ever wanted to see the clearest sunset ever? There are some people who are just immediately, their eyebrows going to raise and they're going to say, yeah, I yeah, love tell sunsets. Me more. Yeah, right? exactly. And when they say, tell me more, that's when the story is starting to work. So now we can use it in the terms of this mountain. And I feel like I'm kind of hopping a little bit here. So I'll keep me on the straight and narrow here. Straight and narrow. Um, you know, this can be for employees, this can be for uh, partners, this can be for customers, anyone, right? So I'm just using a customer analogy here. I say, hey, if, uh, I sell tours to go to the, to see the most, the greatest sunsets in the world. So my question starts with, have you ever wanted to see a beautiful sunset before? And someone says, yes. How do you do that? You say, so I take this journey up this mountain. And when you get to the top, I see this beautiful sunset. Can I tell you some more? Now I'm starting a story because I know who I'm talking to. I know where I'm taking them and they're listening because they want to start to follow in on that journey or that path. Is that, is that, are we starting to get the right bone? Yeah, after that? absolutely. Going? Absolutely. I mean, the best thing anyone can say to you is tell me more. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Tell me more about that. Or actually even, and even, I mean, not as great, but still useful is I'm not interested. I mean, you kind of want to get at the heart of your story, your offer, whatever, quickly, and because because you don't want to waste anyone's time. So, in in your sense, that very emotional appeal of, hey, are you into sunsets? Do you do you want to see the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen, or that you'll ever see? Oh yeah, tell me more. Hey, I take this beautiful journey through this you know wooded path that is a rainforest. And as we get to the top of this mountain, it just sort of revealed the most beautiful sunset over the most beautiful city in the world. And, oh, wow. When can, where do I sign? Right? Like, cause you've qualified who you're talking to. So that's another thing about storytelling and brands that seems to be missing is that they don't, they're not specific, right? They don't, they tend to be too wide in what they tell. And there's a very common construct in storytelling is specificity equals universality. What does that mean? Well, the more specific you can get on a story with details, mostly showing what the details are as opposed to telling what the details are, that becomes more universal. And the reason is, is that people see themselves in your story. They don't generally see themselves in a very generic, like, oh, we circumvent the dominant paradigm to coalesce the vapors of human existence into a tangible form. It's like, what the heck does that mean? Like, you know, for your example is, I'll take you on the most beautiful hike in the world through lush rainforest to the top of this vista where you get to see the most beautiful city, in my opinion, in the world. A little more detailed, right? At, at, you know, at, you know, whatever. But that specificity equals universality is something that can be missing in storytelling. And that's the reason why it's so powerful to tell stories about your experience, right? And so as a general rule, what I like to say when when people say, okay, well, I got, you know, I got my company and I got to tell my story. I got to do my one liner, right? Always like the, the elevator pitch, like, how do I do the elevator pitch? And I always say, To them, I say, look, be as specific as you can, because then that will narrow down who you're talking to and also take them on an emotional journey so that it, it, you, they, that they feel it in their heart. Because if you can't get the emotion, 
you're done. Right? And it's just a transaction, right? So let's let's try this out a little bit here, right? Uh, and because you know, people who may be watching it might be business owners. Uh, I, I happen to work with a lot of companies that uh, are in the service service, mm -hmm. and trades, service industry. Right? Yeah. Trades. So I'm going to pick a uh, you know I'll, I'll pick a uh, I'll, I'm going to start a story here. Okay. Just to show maybe kind of on the fly how we can build something. Mm -hmm. You're watching a football game because football is the stuff that that is your sacred time on Sundays to watch football. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing that can happen is just as they're, th uh, you know, uh, third and, 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 and four inches, <laughs> right? Yeah. Is that you hear your son, your daughter, your spouse say, there's a cockroach in the kitchen again. <laughs> yeah, that would be bad. <laughs> like, uh, how do you want that story to end? Yeah. And I let you yeah. watch that down complete. Right. Now you've built a story and it's not, it has nothing to do about the fact that you get rid of cockroaches. <laughs> it has everything to do with the fact that the person wants to watch that football game. That's the game that that's the story that they want to be part of mm -hmm. and they want to finish. And, and you're already kind of just emotionally drawn into the story there. Right. 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 Uh, yeah. That's is, I mean, am I, I mean, this is what you do for so many companies, right? Build those stories. How, how, how am I doing there? <laughs> Yeah, no, you're doing well because there's an emotional appeal, right? So what's interesting about that story is that I'm sure if you're in an area where there's cockroaches, you've, this has happened to you before. <laughs> and it could be a different story. It could be, you know, like not just a football game. It could be dinner party. It could be a book club. It could be whatever. Like there is a something you want to do that's fun. And there's this annoying thing that you have to take responsibility for it, a fix, that's just going to take you away from the thing that you really want to do. Right. So there's this loss aversion and the emotion of like, oh gosh, not this again. Right. And as a company that provides a service that can handle, right. Getting rid of cockroaches or any kind of pests or whatever, you want to, you want to tap into that emotion so that when that happens, you're top of mind. And, you know, I don't know what like a company like that's like tagline would be, but, right. but you can imagine a visceral response to the, to your wife or your partner saying, there's a cockroach in the kitchen again. And you're just right. like, oh, really? Uh, what do you go? 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Right. And but you can't hold on, depending on how skittish those people, because that's a bad situation for everyone, right? Because where there's one, there's many. <laughs> I've learned that one. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 that's the narrative, and that, that, and and I think that is sort of what you get at when you talk about the pain that your company solves, right? You're like, oh, there's a certain pain, and I solve it. And you would hope that, you know, what you could respond to is like, hey, go, you know, hey, there's a number on the fridge, go talk to Bob over at, you know, Acme Pest, and he'll take care of you. Or, oh, I'll go call Bob at Acme, and he'll be right over. Like, even better, right? Because there's this, I am not being taken away from the thing, the, like, this thing I really want to do. I just had this dread moment <laughs> where I'm like, oh, not again. But then immediately I think of Bob over at Acme Pest. Oh, I'll just call Bob because I know Bob will take care of me, right? That's right. And 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 that is a very um, that's a very powerful connection that well, not a lot. Of, I mean, even as a tech company, that connection to the customer or that that experience, it's a very powerful story to tell, right? Because what are you going to say? Let's say. Your friend Jim's got the same problem. You're going to be like, oh, well, talk to Bob. Bob will take care of you. Then that story ripples through, ripples through, ripples through. So if you, if you think about it, you start to see that, oh, well, really? Yeah, okay, I'm an exterminator or I take care of cockroaches. Yeah. What am I really doing? What am I so really doing? Let's let's transform this. Let's come up with a I mean, you work with a lot more tech companies, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and again, I think the through line here is it doesn't matter what you do, you add some value for people. Correct. And if you can understand what it is that what, what you said, what what is it, the pain that you solve, right? The right. specific words you said. If you know what your specific pain is, and you can build a story around that, it doesn't right. matter who your customer is, right? And, Correct. And I'd like to kind of flip this around after this and talk about 
employees because employee engagement, employee uh, retention are huge issues these days. And how maybe we can use some stories for leaders here. So let's huge. do like a tech company. Okay. So um, I create an app that allows uh, multiple people uh, in a family to talk together via video chat, you know, a WhatsApp or, a, you know, maybe um, another company. Uh, or, uh, you know, I've, I've seen these Netflix watching parties, right? Yeah. Where you can yeah, watch yeah. You know, multiple people. Um, COVID has separated your family. Mm -hmm. And that is painful because there's nothing more important to you than family. Mm -hmm. But what if you could collect together online and watch the show at the same time together? Mm -hmm. and that's what we do. Now you've we woven a story out of the fact that I've got this app that just connects the three of you, <laughs> three different parties. Yeah. yeah, not even about the technology at the initial point, right? It's about connecting with family. Yeah. I miss my family. I would love to connect with them. How can I do that when I've got to be sequestered in a room? So let's let's flip this around. I mean, we're talking about employees and stuff, right? Yeah. And this uh -huh. is a big challenge for everybody. Is uh, leaders just trying to get their people Huge. engaged and get them back in, right? Yeah. Any, I mean, have you had experience? Do you, do you see any reason why you can't use this storytelling for increasing in retention and engagement with your employees? No, not at all. I think it's all, actually, it starts, growth and scale of any company starts with the story you tell the employees and the team. If, if that's muddled and what you say internally is different than external, people will just say like you're full of it. Like you're just... You're, you're, no, you're a talking head and all you care about is money or whatever. Whatever, they're going to make up their own like determination on your value when your story's muddled and your story's not straight between what you say externally and internally. I mean, you see one of the, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of talk about Amazon as an example. And, you know, the drive for more growth and the drive for all of these, um, you know, the challenges that that, that has. And you talk to employees and you see a lot of these, like there was that huge uh, tornado that just ripped through the South a couple of weeks ago. One of the tragedies of that is that a, I think is at least five or six people died at an Amazon warehouse, right? And that's tragic. And it's just unexcusable. Like, you know, who knows exactly what happened, but the, the stories that come out, which has been consistently throughout all the kind of tragedies of that, is that they don't care about their employees and their contractors, and you know they they can't you know they can't take time off. There, there's just a not a there. There's no care and nurturing of the employee because you know they're driven by the bottom line. Externally, they may say a bunch of things, and they and some of it may be true, may not be true. But the dominant narrative that per percolates up is that you don't care about us. Now, as a customer, let's say, say, for example, I have to make a choice between do I buy something from Amazon or someplace else. Over time, that's going to wear on me. If you have any, if you just, you're like, well, you know, maybe there's an alternative. Maybe I can shop local. Maybe there's another place I can go, right? And so when those, are, those two stories disconnect, over time, it, it, it's, it's, it's just bad. And so... For, for, for leaders that are trying to like incentivize their employees and like treat them with respect and dignity and the stories they tell them, I mean, that starts with treating them with dignity and respect and believing the story that you say. I mean, the corporate PR is one thing, but you have to live it on the ground. Like the boots on the ground have to feel what the corporate narrative is. And that's so hard to do. You know, so what I think what I'm hearing here is there's opportunities, even in situations like that. You know, I do remember some companies, I want to say it was uh, Target. There was a breach where a number of credit cards were lost. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where you can use the power of storytelling to actually turn situations like that. Well, actually, even more relevant, I think a lot of people see this, is lots of companies, I mean, hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as COVID came around, they started saying, we have changed our cleaning policies. We turn around rooms uh, with a higher, and you know, we do these four or five things because cleanliness of the rooms, the sanitation and the, 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 the disinfection of the room is most important to us because we value our customer. Mm -hmm. The story they're telling you is you're important 
And we've made mm-hmm. some changes to make sure that we have responded to that. And it may not be a cliffhanger of a story, but you say, you know what, Marriott, uh, I will come and stay with you, even though I would not necessarily go to a, a family member's house because I'm a little worried about going, going there. Yeah. Come and stay at Marriott instead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like, look at the Women's Tennis Association. I don't know if you've heard this story about the that Chinese tennis player. I don't remember her name off the top of my head. But talk about like a pretty consistent story about how they are not going to bow down to this. Clearly something's wrong with that situation. His internal and external narrative were consistent. And that takes a lot of courage because, I mean, that could be anyone. That could be any one of the players in their association this could happen to. And, you know, with... That's a, and and like allegations of sexual misconduct and all sorts of things like should be taken extremely seriously. There should be, you know, an open dialogue. Like, is she really okay? It's hard to tell, but the, the women's tennis association, the CEO is just like, no, we don't value this. We don't care if this is going to cost us billions of dollars, which it probably will. This shall not stand. That's what we tell externally and internally. And I don't know the, the guy who runs it, but that's leadership by storytelling because they're saying the same thing internally and externally, and they're living that story as opposed to, again, some of these other companies that may or may not live that. Like it may be some PR spin, but boots on the ground, that didn't ripple down. There's clearly a misalignment of the story they're telling their managers or their employees. Um, and that's just that even though a company like, as example, Amazon's huge, growing rapidly, I mean, the same thing happened with Facebook when that happened with them, where they're like, oh, well, you signed up to say that we could use your data. And you're like, I didn't sign up for what you did with you know, Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe, but that's not in good faith. And you just see the cracks happening. Yeah, they're huge, com- but eventually those, those crumble. Just only a matter of time. I mean, just look at look at the look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, right? Biggest companies in the world now. Twenty years ago, were oil companies, energy companies. Now they're tech companies. What's it going to be in the next twenty years? I don't know, but it, you know, it, it's 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 interesting. So I think you got to live live the story. Like internal and external should be consistent, and you know, I employees resonate with that. Yeah, so I think maybe even to that point, well, I've, I've got a good friend who talks about uh, a lot of companies keep talking about or talk about this idea of culture. Hmm. And they talk about this idea of vision and try to create these pathways for people. And some people do more lip service than they do actual service, right? Uh, activation of it. Mm-hmm. But the biggest challenge within companies oftentimes is the clarity for everyone in all layers of the company, right? Does the person at the bottom of the ladder and the person at the top of the ladder understand the same, have the same clarity? That clarity is a story, Mm -hmm. right? If everybody knows what part and piece they are uh, as part of the larger whole, right? Whether Mm -hmm. they're the cog, whether they're the wheel, whether they're the spoke in the wheel, whatever the case may be, right? Mm -hmm. If they understand what piece they play, it's so much easier for them to align with where the company is going. If they're not, they're just creating friction the whole time. So it's, so storytelling is not only just about the idea of getting people to come along for the ride, it's about building that congruence and that, uh, that alignment within the organization. And yeah. it's something, you know, I've always believed that if I run a company, I want all the people in my company, when they're not having a barbecue in the backyard with their friends, they're not, hopefully they're not thinking about me, <laughs> right? Yeah. But someone comes to them and says, so what do you do? And if they can't explain what we do as a company, I'm, I'm just, I'm throwing money away. <laughs> well, no, you are. Yeah, you are. Right. And that's the power of it, right? That's the reason why having a big idea really, I mean, spending the time to have that percolate up and down the chain of command is super important because as a leader, you really have no control over anything. You can only persuade people to your point of view. Once you realize that your whole job is persuasion and storytelling as a leader, and you're stopping this whole draconian, like, you know, there's a lot of companies that have put in these productivity, like tools on people's laptops. It's like, you need to be at your desk for eight hours a day or blah, blah, you know, like just really myopic, completely missing the point, have no clue how, you know, like 
who are you? What are you? We piecework, you know, robots, right? Completely miss the mark and people will leave. I mean, eventually you see that in um, big companies like that have these policies that people don't agree with. They're like, I'll just leave. I'll go somewhere else if they can. Now, of course, some can't, you know, if you're a gig worker, if you're a, someone in some of these companies that you're like stuck, like that's horrible. And there's lots of movements to get people, you know, to be part of a union, have collective bargaining and really try to champion that. And you see those narratives bubbling up even more and more. I mean, people are fed up, right? And if you don't want that to happen to your company, then you have to really do some soul searching. Like what kind of company do I want to build? What story am I telling? Not only my management, but the, the person all the way down, literally the janitor, right? Like what am I telling them? And if that's not consistent and it's not like, cohesive and it's not solid and it's not what you say internally and externally people are not stupid <laughs> I mean, like if they have an option they will go to some place that's going to tell a better story i mean great brands tell great stories best story wins here it's it doesn't even matter what your product is like look at some of these crazy products that are like not that great but they win right microsoft windows <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even Zoom, right? Even like love Zoom, but even Zoom's not the best for certain things. But hey, they told the best story, right? That's right. That's right. Even though we're on Zoom. <laughs> there you go, that's, right? That's right. So here's a couple of things that I heard. I, I want to recount some of this because I want you to kind of um, tell me a little bit. I mean, this is what you do for companies, right? You kind of mm -hmm. put together this story, this narrative that they can start to use yes. right, for, for alignment mm -hmm. internally and externally. Mm -hmm. right. and, and 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 I think an important thing here, just as I realized as I said that, is once you start to create this overall story of the company, this huge overarching idea, it is actually the same story that's told internally and externally, right? It's not one story here, one story here, one story here. It's an nope. overarching message, right? Yep. This is what we do. We, we take people to see the mountain vistas all over the world that are once in a lifetime experiences. Well, now your employees understand, ah, that's what we do. The way we make this interesting for our customers is because we help them get to the top of that vista, right? Mm -hmm. Whether they're in, whether in, you know, they're physically uh, challenged in the sense that they can't walk on their two legs, well, we find a way to make it happen, right? Yeah, we find a way. If they don't have the physical uh, constitution to do it, we'll get them up there via helicopter, whatever the case may be, right? But now right. all of a sudden it gives them the space to say, that's my role is to help people get to the top of that, right? And experience that journey to the top. Mm -hmm. the customers understand where they're going. So I think there's a couple of things here that I want to kind of touch on to kind of just loop back a little bit of what I've heard. Sure. You know, storytelling parts. I, first, I heard the data, right? You got to have some data, some key factual elements, right? Those key factual elements that data leads to information. And I think that information is something that the person who's listening to the story is creating that information. They now have knowledge of something that they did not before. Oh, there's vistas out there. I didn't know I could see that. I can get there. You have the capability of telling, huh? Now the wisdom is, I know I've always wanted to go and see those those things. I just didn't have the time, the preparation, or the inclination. Maybe the finances, or didn't know what the finances required to do that. Now I have this company is telling me for nine, the low low price of 1995. I'm, exactly. I'm going to get it <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and that's how it works, right? Uh, yeah, and e and even better, and even better. Once you've got the the data, the information, and the knowledge, now you've engaged the company to take you to the vista, and then the wisdom is, wow, oh, that was really worth it. That actually exceeded my expectations. Mm -hmm. That was life changing. I am now with. I'm going to tell everyone I know about this, right? That's the ultimate for any company, and I think. As the other model that I always like to think about is this whole learn, do, teach model, right? Learning is data and information. Teaching is knowledge or learning. Learning is data and information. Doing is like the knowledge. And then the teaching is the wisdom. Like I have gained something. I am now teaching it. And, and it maybe I've, I've muddled it up a bit, but that's a very powerful thing for a customer and a company too. So you want a customer as a company, you want a customer to learn about what you do, right? By stories. You actually want them to do what you offer. And then you want them to teach others what you do. <laughs> That's the ultimate, like the advocate, right? Like, oh, 
hey, you know what? If you need to figure out the engagement of your staff through artificial intelligence and great, very good storytelling that's very compassionate and caring, you got to check out Karma. Like they know what they're doing because like you've interacted with it. So you're now, your customers are teaching other people about what you do. Your, your employees can do the same thing. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a cycle, I guess would be the word I'd use. And if you have that mentality, I think it helps, it helps with all of this. So yeah, I think it's, it's a powerful thing to think about it that way. I mean, as a leader, are the stories I'm telling my customers and employees uh, allowing them to do something that I would like them to do, learn why that's important, and then teach others their experience? Seems like a pretty good, pretty good use of time, I think, because you just then amplify everyone, right? Yeah, and I, I can't remember if we talked about this one on, on, on your podcast, but I love. I've, there's this term out there, servant leadership, mm, and we did. I mean, and and I and I I, I do believe there's some value to that. Mm -hmm. I, I understand where it's coming from. I just personally, I, I like to discern between words a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I specifically use words for a reason, right? And servant to me, there's one person who wins, one person who loses, right? Mm, servant. Yeah. And that's why I've I've been starting to use this idea or trying to champion this cause of invitational leadership, right? I, as the leader mm. of a company, see a better outcome that can occur. Right. Would you like to come with me? Or collaborative. I like collaborative too. I think yeah. invitation because it it's like you have a choice. Yeah. And I think employees, customers, they want choices. And I think if you lay out the choice that they have to make in a clear, concise, and a compelling way through a story that's going to emotionally drive them to consider your choice. That's all you can do, honestly. Like that's, that's right. the whole art of persuasion. <laughs> like, you have a choice. Now, if we were in Russia, you had no choice, then it's easy. I mean, prop it is propaganda, right? <laughs> I mean, there's propaganda here too in the US, but I'm just saying like, takes on a very different thing when the bread line's 25 feet, you know, 100, 300 feet long. And they're saying, no, oh, everything's great. And so you're like, uh, that's propaganda. <laughs> I have no choice in the matter. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, no, I, I love this idea of the opt-in, right? Uh, whether it's employees, partners, colleagues, uh, customers, whatever, giving them the opportunity to opt in where they say, yeah, I want to go there. And then yeah. they say, well, I'm going there already and I can yeah. take you there. You want to yeah. come along, right? My, my, I, I've got a cruise ship. It's already left the docks, but I got a speedboat that can catch you up. You want to jump on the speedboat? <laughs> right. Yeah, and I mean, it's a great, actually, a really great analogy. The opt-in, the you, you always want your communications and your storytelling to invite people to opt in, so it's their choice. Yeah, that's right. Anything that's, that's more better, it's a much better conversation when they say, "Yes, I yeah. want that." Right? And yeah, and it's it, it, it's a stronger bond, right? Yeah. This is whole like uh, learn, do, teach methodology, right? Like, oh, I'm actively learning this. I do it. And then I teach to someone. I'm opted in on each part of that phase. Yeah, that's right. I want that with every customer and every employee. I, I, if you don't want to be part of my organization, then please don't be part of my organization. Because I honestly want to see you be successful somewhere else. Because And I think that's the other thing you got to realize. Like, your story may not resonate with everyone. They just might not get it. They may not like it. They may not like you or whatever, but that's not your problem. That's right. Your problem is to show, don't tell, but show your, how your vision of the world is going to come about. And you do that through telling clear, concise, and compelling stories about what you do. And you hope that everyone that's interacts with you repeats the same story. <laughs> it's like, a, like, you want it to be a meme, right? Like, oh, it just spreads on its own. That, that's the only way to grow, in my opinion. So uh, I'm actually just like our last conversation. When time went really, really fast. Um, I want to be able. To, I always like to give people some take-home action items, right? They can always walk away and do one, two, or three things. So if people want to become, they, they've listened to this. They've said, I, I can see how I can use this universal message that not only applies to again to my customers, my partners, my vendors, my uh, my employees, my colleagues, whatever, 
whoever it may be the case. Mm -hmm. I can create this universal message. Well, then the, the key to all of what we've been talking about is this weaving of this message, this narrative, right? The central narrative or story that everybody can buy into from the various perspectives and uh, all the different stakeholders. So give me uh, a sense of I mean, because I know this is what you do for companies. Mm -hmm. and I highly recommend that if anyone has a question about it, please yeah. feel free please to reach out to me reach or out. to Jerry directly. Yeah. Give me you know, one, two or three things. If somebody wants to start this journey of finding out what their main narrative is, right? That yeah. overarching narrative. Yeah. How do you get there? What are, what are one? Yeah. Couple, couple yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, there's like one, the most important step is step one is figuring out what your big idea is. Okay. The big idea is the North star of any organization, company movement or whatever. And I say, I say, I call it the big idea because I think it's got to transcend the, the whoever is there. It, it, it should stand the test of time and live on when you're gone. <laughs> That's like the way I like to think of it. And so there's really three parts to the big idea. There's why you're doing this. And that's the internal why that's the, you know, independent of fame, fortune, prestige, all those external factors. It's like deep in your heart. Why am I doing this? That's got to come through as an emotional appeal. There's the uniqueness. Like why is this thing different than everything else out there? And everything in the world has got some unique components that are going to resonate with people. <clears throat> Typically you pick one because you may have lots of uniqueness, but you don't want to be too distracted. And then the third thing is the pain that you solve. If you can pull those things together in a less than 10 second said in a nice, you know, calm way, um, then you've got a pretty good big idea. And that should be the North Star for your organization. That leads to the mission, vision, and values. That leads to all this stuff. But it's the tip of the spear. It's the thing. It guides everything. And that's a powerful thing to think about because the reason why that's so important is if anyone's like lost on the track to where you're going, they always follow the North Star. Like, oh, we're going there. All right. And then you can say to your, your folks, you can be like, if, if you got to do something that furthers this mission, do it or furthers this big idea, do it. Don't, don't, you don't have to bug me about it because we're all going down the same path. And so, yeah, I think that's the most, for any company, that's like the most important thing to figure out. And I actually spend a lot of time helping companies with this because it's actually harder than you think. <laughs> and, and, but once you get it, you're like, oh, okay. And then you're like, I literally tell them, tape it on, print it out, tape it on your computer. <laughs> And every time you're typing an email, every time you're writing a piece of content, every time you're like interacting with an employee, look at it. Oh, that's what we do. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Oh, no, that's what we do. We do this. Uh, you know, I, I will tell you personally, that resonates a lot. It, it took me a lot, lot, lot longer than I expected, you know, for myself. Um, I didn't realize it until I kept asking myself. And it, uh, the journey was probably about a two and a half year journey to get here to where yeah. I got to this point. Yeah. One of my... One of my kids is 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 a little different than the average kid, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Uh, and I realize I don't want that kid ever to be treated differently in the workplace. Right? Mm -hmm. There are talents and capabilities that that mm -hmm. child has that others may not see because it requires a different set of lenses. Mm -hmm. So how do I build a work environment that allows for that to come? That set of lenses to be on the shelf so that people can say, "I see that." Right? Yeah. And I mean, if uh, to, the reason I'm sharing that is it is so deeply personal. It's not something I have to get up every day and say, oh, gosh, I got to go do this. It is core and essential to what I do. So everything is driven by it. It's not yeah. driven by this idea of willpower, how much how many dollars I'm going to make, to, to your point. Right? Yeah. I can't wait to get to it the next day. Yeah. And everyone in the company has somebody in their life whether an aunt, uncle themselves that has gone through that and they start to identify with, and all the people in the company, my organization has started to align to that because there's something personal in it for themselves along that same line. Yeah, exactly. I'm not pulling people along. They're pulling me. 
right? And I think that's the beauty of the storytelling here. And I think that's the shift that you'll start to see. That inflection point is when everyone starts to, it is a grassroots movement mm-hmm. within the organization where they say, yeah, I want that. And the organization that I'm part of is the vehicle that's going to get me there. Oh, exactly. Crap. I think that's some magic right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's how, that's how people, that's how companies scale. That's how companies become successful. Even the ones we've been talking about, even the Amazons of the world back in the day, even the Facebook, like all these ones that were now villains, right? People are getting like, oh, fed up. They started that way. They really started that way. There was something there and they lost their way. Don't get me wrong. Like, I think they've lost their way and the marketplace and, and we as, as consumers, will help them correct the way. Because you just look around at the world, like we're all, I mean, you have to see the compassion and the humanity in everyone, right? Like to your point, right? Everyone has a unique perspective. Everyone's some somebody that has a gift to give. And it may seem a little bit like, you know, woo woo, but it's true. And it may be woo woo, but it can still be true, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and, and as society, we have to see the humanity in everyone. We have to like really work hard to then have them tell their story and have us interact in a way that we just make the world better. And you do that through telling your story. Uh, it's as simple as that. I, I, I wish it was like some, you know, oh, great thing. <laughs> But it is heaven, true. The heaven, the clouds open. The heaven, the heaven yeah. Well, we're, 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 you know, we've, we've, we've hired your company to take us to this beautiful sunset. The, the clouds part and we see the sunset and we're like, that's the meaning of life. <laughs> okay. It's 42. It's 42. Or, you know, um, if you're a Monty Python fan, right? Like you know, Life of Brian or whatever. Well, um, I hope for anyone who's had a chance to listen and hear that you've gotten something out of this. I mean, I, uh, I suspect our journey was a little bit of meandering here, but I, I, I got to also think that along the way here, we started to show how this universality, or, I mean, specificity equals universality. I love that. I think that's sort of almost the governing component of what I heard here today mm-hmm. is that if we can build this story that with that specificity, it is universal to all the people within the organization, internal and external, right? And it yeah. becomes so it becomes that north star. I think that's really the important part, yeah. Here, right? Yeah, you want people to see themselves in your story. They do that. If they can see can themselves be. in your story. You don't have to push them. They come. Along. They will pull you along. hundred oh, percent. I love, absolutely love when you said that they're pulling you along. That that I would think is the apex of leadership. So. Hopefully you've got something out of this. I, I know I do. I think they ne- got the next hairs in the back of my neck standing up a little bit here because uh, <laughs> it's so exciting to apply some of this stuff. Uh, so thank you for listening and feel free to leave comments, thoughts uh, for, again, for Jerry or myself, but happy Jerry, to help. thank you for spending some time with me and uh, dropping some knowledge on me. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. I'll just, again, love the Love the conversation. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Have a great holiday. Stay safe and uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah, that sounds sounds good.